I suppose in America, everyone has heard of MIT, certainly in the Bay Area, Stanford, you know, there's Oxford and Cambridge and so on. In, in the Hasidic world, there was a, the equivalent of those prestigious, yeshi, uh, prestigious schools, and it was called Tom Tuminim, and it was in this actual, the actual village or city of Lubavitch. And uh, the Rebbe once made a very interesting comment, and he said that uh, just like all of the Jewish people are somehow included in the generation that left Egypt, he once made a comment that the students that the Rebbe Rashab had in Taim Chetmimim, to a certain extent, included all of like the Lubavitcher students forever. This Taim Chetmimim is over 125 years or something like that. So we're talking about many tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of students, and yet the, the original students of Taim, of Taim Chetmimim you know, they, they were outstanding. They were the Rebbe's army. The Rebbe started teaching the philosophy of Chabad in a practical sense, actually, to them. They're very dedicated to Rebbe Rashab. In the year 1901, though, uh, the, one of the highlights of the times when they would spend time with the Rebbe was Yutas Kislev. Yutas Kislev in Lubavitch, uh, in Taim Chetmim, was very special. The Rebbe would come, he would have a meal with, with the students. And uh, often it would go a whole night, he would talk, he would fabreng. It was, it was, um, it was a t in Yiddish, we would, I don't know if we're Hebrew actually. It was a w time of giluyim, a time of revelation. But in the year 1901, for some reason, the Rebbe Rashab was not in Lubavitch. And he was uh, involved, I think, with something with the community affair. And the people were really sad that uh, their Rebbe, who usually fabreng with them and Yutas Kislev, would not be there. Uh, but what happened was that he sent them a letter. And that's the famous letter that begins with the Hayom Yom. It's a book that the Rebbe gave out, the compilation of they, they And essentially in that letter, though the Rebbe was not there physically, the Rebbe gave out uh, a summary of what really is Yutes Kislev about. I mean, we're celebrating the, the liberation. A tzaddik was in prison, he was freed, he could have died, he was, he was not. Uh, he was given permission to teach, but, but really what's going on? And the, and the letter, which is printed, of course, in the beginning of Hayom Yom is, it is a day, but now these are his words, Er v'chayes nafsheinu nitan lanu. Then he continues that this is the day of Rosh Hashanah of Hasidus. This is a day of Er v'chayes nafsheinu, light and life, L-I-F-E, was, was given to us on this day. And this is the day which on um, Yutes Kislev, which we celebrate the teachings of Hasidus, this is like a Rosh Hashanah. Just like on Rosh Hashanah, uh, everything is written down during the year, what will happen, what will, what will occur during the year is written down on Rosh Hashanah, but it's much more than that. Rosh Hashanah shapes the destiny of the year, so to also Yutes Kislev, shapes the destiny of every chosid, because this is the day that light and life was given to us. So since those holy words, which is over a hundred, it was 18 years ago, since, since that time, many of the rabbis used to speak about what, is, what, what, what does it mean? And I'm gonna share with you one, one or two thoughts that the rabbi has from, uh, I saw, I was reading in, in the, his fathers. And he writes the, but I'll say it in my words. The, the basic idea of light, and, and I mentioned this on Shabbos, those of you that still remember, base, the idea of can a person live without light? Um, for us, actually, in the 21st century, I think the answer would be no, we can't. But uh, when you think about it, a person could have food, he could have shelter, he could even have companionship without light. You could sit in darkness or live in darkness and uh, nothing really is missing other than the vision that you would have through light. So when there's a blackout, people don't disappear. And if you're camping and you don't have uh, electricity and it's a dark night, I mean, you're still quite aware of your surroundings. It's not as clear, that's all. What does it mean, light? So one of the things that we could say about light, of course, there's an image, you know, bright, cheery, and so on. But on a very practical level, what light does is, it brings you to truth 
very quickly. So if, if, for example, the lights went out and you were in a room, it would take a long time for you to figure out the surroundings of the room. You would have to touch, you would have to feel, you might even try to smell or taste. And if you wanted to leave the room, it's become very, very difficult. You'll, you'll fill glass, is that a glass door, is that the glass window, you gotta be careful, you open it up, where does it leading me, and so on. So you have to go through trial and error. And you might have to spend hours trying to figure out where the exit is. But then of course, when you put on the electricity, it's within, it's, it, it's instantaneous. You know exactly where you have to go. To a certain extent, in, in, the, in Judaism, or in Yiddishkeit in general, all of us are trying to find a path, or better yet, all of us are trying to connect to the, to the divine, to Hashem. And we don't have to necessarily um, tap in the, in the darkness. Hashem gives us Torah and mitzvahs, and in a general way it's called Torah or Ner mitzvah, right? A candle is a mitzvah, and Torah is light. So you don't have to experiment in life what to do. But actually, even within Torah and mitzvahs, you, you need a type of a clarity to make it, I used the word before, real. To, to make it, and that's where Hasidus comes in. Hasidus doesn't add anything, so to speak, to Judaism, but everything within Judaism becomes a lot clearer. Becomes, becomes a lot more vibrant. There was a time when all of us were satisfied with black and white TV. Then it became color TV. No one watches black and white. And then within the color, they, they, they keep on refining it. I don't even know what they stand for. HD, this, this, that. I mean, they keep on becoming really more vivid, more, it's, it's amazing. And, and in the future, they say it's gonna be, I think, 16 times. I can't figure out how it could be more realistic than it is already, <laughs> but, 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 that's, but that's where they're going. So now, if you, you know, for your good friend, you wanna buy him a TV, God forbid, never, you know, shouldn't do that, of course. <laughs> but if you give him a black and white, you're not giving him much, unless, unless he uses it as an antique. You know, that's something else. So when it comes to Yiddish guy, Judaism, Lahavdal to make a separation between the frivolous and the true. Uh. Hasidus adds a, a, a vividness or a, a it's almost like a reality check in all of the Torah and all of the mitzvahs that we do. You know, there, there's actually a. Uh, I'll try to come back to it if I could uh, rem uh, hold my thoughts. There's actually a charming story with the Alter Rebbe where he had a, a brilliant, one of his brilliant students, his name was Rabbi Avram. Strangely enough, Kaliska, but it's not the famous Rabbi Avram of Kalis the Rebbe, he was a student of, of the Alter Rebbe, he was a very brilliant man. And uh, the, they, they were once discussing, the, the, the teacher with a student, about the difference between the rabbis of old and the rabbis of today. And very loosely, between the year 1100 and the year 1500, those, those 400 years are called Rishonim, the early rabbis. So some famous ones, Rashi, Rambam, you heard of them, Rajba, Rosh, these are Rishonim. And then from mid, uh, uh, in the year 1500, in the mid of that, for the next approximately 300 years, it's called Acharonim, the later rabbis. So the Shulchan Aruch, is the time when Rishonim turned into Achronim. Now they're all great. Each one's writing a commentary. So he was trying to explain um, to his student the difference the way a Rishon, one of those great sages between 1100 and 1500 thought about Torah in contrast to a great sage of 1600, 1700. And he gave him a practical example. He took out one of the books from the Rishonim, Maram Mirutenberg, the year 1200 approximately, and he showed him um, one of the responsa. And over there, I don't know what the question was, but he, he deals with a question, he gives an answer, and to strengthen his answer, he gives a, 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 he gives a reference to the Talmud. So it's not a very big, uh, it's, it's like a page long. 
And he says to Rabbi Avram, study it and come back to me. He studied it at length. He understood it very well. He understood the question. He understood the answer. And he stood, understood the proof. Comes back, when he came back to the Rebbe, the Rebbe asked him, he says, well, now that you know the question and the answer, can you think of other places in the Talmud that would seem to support it? This guy was brilliant. He said, as a matter of fact, I could think of. And he came up with seven other places in the Talmud where it seems to imply what, what, what his answer. Said the Alter Rebbe, that's all you could think of. I'll give you another eight, in addition to the seven. And of course, he was amazed at his Rebbe's uh, I say, your edition. How do you pronounce it? Erudition. Er- erudition. His, his Rebbe's erudition. He knew everything, you know. And he was right. So now there's 15 proofs to this point. Says the Alter Rebbe to Rabbi Avram. He says, if there are 15 other proofs, why did he pick that proof? Good. He said, I, I, I don't know. As a matter of fact, looking at that proof seems to be weaker than the other 15. So, I don't know. So what did the Alter Rebbe do? He took each one of the 15 proofs, seven of his, eight of his own, and he showed how it's really not a proof at all because of this, because of that. So now, the, this guy is completely overwhelmed with the logic and the brilliance of, number one, offering a possible proof and then rebutting it. Then the Alter Rebbe said to him, so now you know why he didn't say it, right? Because the one place in Talmud which none of us could slug up, none of us could, could weaken it, is, is the one that he brought. But he said, do you think that when he wrote his answer, he went through all of those 15 proofs, analyzed it, discounted it, and was left with the last one? No, no. He knew right away that the 15 proofs that we brought were not right. He knew the correct place to answer this particular question. And he said that's the difference between the Rishon and the Akron. The Rishonim, these sages, for 400 years, when they discussed something of Talmud or Jewish law, they somehow had such a clarity of vision in Talmud and in all of Midrash, they knew exactly where to look. The Achronim are brilliant. They, know th- they, they, they went through everything. But each time they went through, they banged their head. Is this it? Seems like it. No, it's not. At the end, maybe they came to the same conclusion. But it was with trial and error. <laughs> you know, they say, uh, <laughs> they, they, I, this is off the subject, but I related. The Vilna Gaon, you all heard of him. Rabbi Elijah, the, uh, uh, he's actually a famous personality on, in the Utah's Kislev story because he was the head of the opponent. But he was, uh, he was the uh, unofficial r- rabbi of Lithuania and certainly of Vilna. But he didn't poskin, he, that wasn't his job to give verdicts about, you know, if someone had a chicken, is it a kosher chicken or not? He was like this super, super, super Supreme Court type of a justice. So there was a Reb Shmuel who was the head of the Besden. He was, he was very great, very knowledgeable. Vilna, you know, in the year 1700. I mean, every one of them knew, was a walking uh, encyclopedia. So basically, Reb Shmuel was the head of the court, but the Vilna Goin was the head of the head. One day, um, a fellow, ca- and Reb Shmuel, was a big tamachacham, but a little bit, I suppose, there was a, what we call professional jealousy. And he was thinking, you know, I'm the head of the, of the court, and uh, the, the Vilna Goyen gets all, all, he gets all of the, the compliments. Everyone talks about the Vilna Goyen, no one talks about me. But I'm actually his, his, his colleague, his peer. So one day, someone came to Reb Shmuel with a question. Very complicated question. Reb Shmuel, who was a walking uh, encyclopedia, did not know the answer. So uh, he said, you know what? It's a good question. I, I have to go for a walk 
just to clear my head a little bit. So he walked around the block. In the meantime, this guy had no patience. So he decided, such a good question that the chief rabbi doesn't know the answer. I'll ask the genius of all geniuses. Knocked on the door, went into the Vilna Goyen, and he asked him the question. He got an answer right away. Comes back, and he's waiting. The Shmuel comes back, his face is bright. I thought of an answer. And he gives the same answer. But the guy's not too impressed. He says, I already got that answer from the Vilna Goyen. So he says, I gave you the same answer. What's the difference? He said, the difference is a walk around the block. <laughs> that's, that's the difference. Yeah, you came up with the same answer, but he didn't have to walk, go for a walk around the block. He knew the answer. You had, yeah. what's, inter what's interesting is that, you know, right, we get tested for smicha, you know, for, for ordination. What's correct is that we know the answer. Uh, most of the time, I shouldn't say most of many of the times, we, I did not know personally the answer, but I sort of um, knew where to look it up. So the question was asked, and I would start looking at, you know, for the answer. The rabbi was really sweet. He didn't let me answer. He said, fine, fine. Anyway, he wrote the smicha. So I asked him, why, why, why did you give me smicha? <laughs> you know and I know I didn't know the answer. He said, yeah, but you were going in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really sweet guy. Yeah. You, were go, you, were, you were going in the right direction. Okay. So I got to tell you, this did not happen with me. But they say that there were, that there were two rabbonim, both of them you know, promising young rabbis. And they, got, they were getting tested. And they didn't know the answer. <laughs> so one, they both asked permission to look up the answer. So he said, okay. They take out, uh, Mother, I can tell you, it's these gigantic big books. I don't know why they make such big books, but it's like a gigantic book, and they're both flipping through the pages, whatever. After like two, three minutes, uh, the Rav says, it's okay, fine, next question. And uh, he only gave one of them ordination. So the other guy said, Rabbi, why did he get the smich and not me? And he said, why do you think you deserve smich, huh? He said, what do you mean? Uh, we were both looking for the answer. <laughs> she said, no. <laughs> he was looking where he thought he lost it. You were looking to find. <laughs> In other words, he sort of knew more or less the answer, but he, he lost it, but he's going back to check it. You know. Anyway, the difference between Arishan and Ahrein is Arishan, they see the truth right away. The Ahreinim, you know, they have to... What Hasidus did was, it helped us open up the eyes to truth. And I'm going to give an example, an example, and I'm going to use an example of two very holy Jews. Truly, two awesome holy Jews, one a Hasid, one not a Hasid, but both a Tzaddik. I'll tell you the names. Not ashamed to tell the story. One is with the Chafetz Chaim, who we all know was a holy, holy Jew. And one was Madame Shapiro, Reb Meir Shapiro. You might know him because he's the famous Reb Meir Shapiro who started the Dafyomi, right, and the Shiva Chachmei Dublin. Reb Meir Shapiro was a chassid, a very dedicated chassid of the Chok of a Rebbe. The Chofetz Chaim was not a chassid. Was not a Masnagid, heaven forbid. He wasn't an opponent, but he grew up in Lithuania. And then he, Hasidus, he did not know what Hasidus was, and he, but he was a tzaddik. The story goes, this is a true story, that, as you know, the Chafetz Chaim was very much involved in the great assembly called the Knesia Hagdailo. You ever heard of Aguda? Aguda means a band of people. And what happened is that in the early 20th century, in the 1900s, um, s realizing that there's so much confusion amongst Jewish people, Bundists and Zionists and Communists and Zionists and Hasidicism, that they all decided that they should get together, all the Orthodox groups should, should, should get together for policy decisions that have to do with, with Klal Yisrael and also that have to do with Poland as a they should, in other words, it should be a united front for all religious Jews. So Hasidim, Misnagdim, everyone joined this group, with some exceptions. So in one of those uh, meetings, the Chafetz Chaim, who was in his high 80s, um, uh, went. 
It was a big spiel. You know, he's going to show his prestige to the thing. And there was also the mayor of Shapiro, Manam of Lu. And uh, when they, people on the way to there, they were on a train. They were on a train. And there were many stops. People heard that the Chafetz Chaim is on the train. So in, 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 in all of these train stations, there were hundreds of people that would wait. So hoping that the Chafetz Chaim would stick out his, his holy face and they would say shalom or maybe they would just see him. Then they would go back saying, I saw the Chafetz Chaim. Lahab the Lelof is to make a separation of separations. You have sometimes a, 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 you know, the royal motorcade or even a presidential motorcade. People line the streets. Well, well, there's no real, pre- but I saw the president. Big spiel. So Lahab the, what happened was, they came to one station. There were hundreds of Jews waiting. And they said, Baruch Haba Chafetz Chaim. And the Rabbi Yitzchak, mayor of Rabin, stayed in his compartment. He didn't want to go out. So no one was going to disturb him. But this Chassid, who was a big, big Rav himself, went into the Chafetz Chaim and he said, Rebbe, people are waiting to see you. So he said the following statement. Let's see if you can figure out what he meant. He said, Rabbi Yitzchak Meyer Esnish came Cholent Freitag. I don't eat Cholent on Friday. Do you know what he meant by that? I'll tell you. Basically, it's a delicacy to eat shalant on Shabbos. So the Chavetz Chaim said, I don't eat shalant on Friday, because if I eat the shalant on Friday, I'm not going to have it on Shabbos. So what he meant to say is, in heaven, there's a certain amount of honor that's given to a Jew who studies Torah. But every single time you get honor on earth, that you, you diminish the honor in heaven. She said, I'm not interested in getting honor. I don't eat children on Friday. Good answer. You know what he told him? You have to have a, you know, show this. He said, Rebbe, I think for the benefit of bringing pleasure to Jews, it's worthwhile for you to have a little bit less covet in heaven. Good. So he told him. The Chavetz Chaim heard it. And he didn't have to say a word. And he went out. And he, he was as far as looking for, 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 for honor as, you know, as, as I speak uh, Chinese. He, he didn't need the honor. He didn't want the honor. He was a tzaddik. But there are Jews that feel good when they see him. They could say, I saw the Chavetz Chaim. I was thinking about the story a lot of times. How could it be, <laughs> you know, that he couldn't figure that out by himself? And I don't really have an answer. And I certainly don't want to talk about the Chavetz Chaim. So instead, I want to say it more in a different form, and that is, it takes Hasidus, and it takes a Hasidic way of life to see certain truths, which after Hasidus brings it out, it becomes apparent. To, make, to jump completely to, to 1994, no, 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 it's probably 1989 or so, in Borough Park, yeah, told him, he says, it's worthwhile. And he said, okay, don't say anything more, and he went out. I think in the late 1980s, you know, Borough Park is, is a very, very religious community in, in Brooklyn, New York. It's beautiful. There are many, many Hasidic groups there, non-Chabad. And there's, of course, many holy Jews that are not Hasidic as well. And they're all living in Borough Park. And one of the things of Hasidut is to share the teachings of Hasidut. As we all know, the Holy Baal Shem Tov, when he asked the Mashiach, when will you come? And the answer was given, when people study your teachings. So in Borough Park, they opened up what's called Hechel, Hechel HaBal Shem Tov. Or they, I think they call it now Hechel Menachem. But it was called the Palace of the Baal Shem Tov. And it was a beautiful room filled with all kinds of Hasidic books. And they periodically, they would have Hasidic get-togethers, and they figured this way they'll get the people from Barapak to come. The biggest day in Hechel Menachem was Yutes Kislev, because they wanted to get not only the average, but they wanted to get the rabbis, the dignitaries, all of the, you know, the personalities in Barapak, even though they're not Hasidim and not Chabad, they should come to show respect to not Chabad, but to show respect more to Hasidus. 
And by doing so, it'll encourage people to come to the place. So the one that does this is Rabbi Label Altoin. He's very much in charge of this. But when he wanted uh, to make one of these big gatherings, there was a big Rav, I don't know his name, it could be the Debrasino Rav, I forget which Rav it was. But what happened is, he wanted to invite him to come. Because if this big shot would come, if this personality would come, then the prestige would go up. You know who was there on Yudas Kislev? Rabbi so-and-so. Okay, you know, it's a kosher place. Maybe we should visit it. But Label all time didn't want to go himself to invite him because he's really a, a, big, a big personality. So he asked Rabbi Yoel Khan to go with him. Rabbi Yoel Khan is a genius in Hasidus. He's like the senior, uh, ph- uh, uh, senior philosopher of Chabad. He's actually, he said, come with me. So they both go to visit this prominent rabbi, and it's a very simple request. Yutes Kislev is coming. We're making a large gathering. You would add a lot of prestige if you could come and join us. So they make the formal presentation, and the rabbi, with all of his uh, truthfulness, says, thank you very much for the invitation, but no. So they said, why no? He said, look, I'm a very prominent rabbi. That's why you're here. I mean, we're not kidding around it. And uh, if I come, you're going to have to show me a lot of honor. And I don't want the honor. I don't need the honor. So Rabbi Yoyo was a little taken back. And that's your excuse? So he then told him the story of... The, uh, no, he didn't tell him. No, he should have. He should have. Maybe he didn't know that story. But he told him the story of the middle of Rebbe. What happened was that the second Rebbe of Chabad had a chassid that had a tremendous memory and almost was able to repeat a, uh, a mimer from the Rebbe verbatim. In other words, like today, we would, we would tape it. He would listen to the Rebbe, understand it, absorb it, and give it over as if it was the Rebbe. And he, he was fantastic. Wherever he went, people gathered around him. So he went to the, to the Rebbe and he says, I have a problem. I know my talent, I do it well, but I tell you, when I do it, I feel, I feel a little arrogant. So maybe I should stop doing it. To which the Rebbe told him, at Sibyllif from the all that, you should become like as pungent as an onion, but you should do chasidus. In other words, you have, an, you have a problem. Your problem is that when you teach, you, you're, you, 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 you get smug. But the, what's more important is that people are learning. So you do teshuva on your own, on your own time, but you continue. So Rabbi El tells it to, this, to the Rav. Be at Sibylla, but, but do it for the people. So what does the Rav answer? He says, so much mesiris nefesh that I don't have. <laughs> to, 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 to become a Sibylla. In other words, to get the honor, to feel good about the honor, but to do it and say, I'll do it anyway, so other people, that much Monsieur Snefesh I don't have. So Rabbi El told over the story many times. And he says, he, could, he, he couldn't believe this guy. He, he just couldn't understand him. He was so wrapped up of what a tzaddik he was. I'm a, I'm a prominent rabbi, but I don't go for honor. <laughs> that because of that, he couldn't see beyond himself. He couldn't see the picture. The picture is, you're a rabbi. Through you, many other people will study Torah. But no, I might get some honor, and I, oh, I'm a very holy Jew. I, I don't like this honor. <laughs> Rabbi El says, he held himself back. What he was going to say is, come, and I'll put you in the back. <laughs> but he don't worry. But, but, yeah, yeah but, he, but he didn't say that. But the purpose of sharing the story with you is... Just simply, without Hasidus, we know Torah concepts. You understand? One of the Torah concepts is, you don't look for honor, you shouldn't run after honor, and so on. But there's also a concept of, put yourself, stop thinking about yourself. It only becomes an issue when all you could see is as far as your nose. So it's all about you. Now the question is, Will I get honor? Will, I, will my merits get less? You know, what's happening with me? Instead of thinking about what is your role in life? Mm-hmm. 
You're a rabbi. You're a very prominent rabbi. You're a big Talmud Chacham. Your job is to inspire as many people as possible. So if you lose a little bit of your world to come, and that's what the Chavaz Chaim, right away, he got up and he went out. He didn't think that, 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 that he wouldn't lose something, but he understood. Hearing it in that form, you're right. To, to make a Jew feel good, it, it's a little, a little bit, not exactly, but it's a little bit connected to, for example, we all know about uh, certain Jews do not, are not comfortable inviting other Jews to their home. Why? Because they have a very holy home. And they have a very holy Shabbos table. And they can't imagine on their holy Shabbos table someone who's not so holy. <laughs> I heard this from my friend, Chaim Grossbaum. I heard it. I don't think it's not Lashon He told it to me. He said, one time we brought home <laughs> someone who was not a Shema Shabbos for the Shabbos meal. I, I remember this. I was in Morristown, New Jersey. Chaim Grossbaum said, my father got up and ate the, the meal in the kitchen. <laughs> he said, you stay with the guest. He's a Lubavitcher. But very, you know, this is the early years, the early, early years of outreach. So a lot of people, I, can, I can't have, um, it's a holy house. I can, yeah. But if you thought just a little bit beyond, let's say the sanctity or the sublimity or whatever you want to call it in your Shabbos table might go down a tiny notch. Or maybe even more than a tiny notch. On the other hand, what this person will do is eat kosher food, make brachas, hear a nice story, hear a devout Torah, be exposed to, to Yiddishkeit. So because, if you're only thinking about yourself, then, no, I'm not such a tzaddik, I don't want to be Moser Nefesh. But if you think about truth, not about you, you'll see that there's plenty of room to negotiate over here. In fact, there's more than room to negotiate. There's this idea of invite. Essentially, the, 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 there's a simple word that I want to share with you. It's in Yiddish, and maybe I'll end up with this because I'm just sort of rambling a little bit. And that is, bedaf ligin in hecher. We have to be focused on things beyond us. Hasidus is, is incredibly holy and valuable for many reasons. I don't have to give a, a approbation about it. But one of the most basic ideas is, when you're studying Shulchan Aruch, for example, about the laws of Shabbos, and they're complicated, so it's about Shabbos. What am I supposed to do? Am I allowed to touch this? Am I not allowed to touch this? If this is on the table, what should I do? It's a hammer. So it's really important laws to know how I'm supposed to live in, in, uh, in this house on Shabbos. But again, it's really about me living here and now, what does God want me to do in this situation? But it's incredibly, imp not only valuable, but it's exhilarating every once in a while to stop thinking about yourself and to start thinking about other things. And the other things is referring to the Almighty God Himself. Instead of thinking about how much reward I deserve, why don't we think about how great God is? And you say, well, you know, these are platitudes. But they're not. I, I, learned, I was learning today the Mimer, Tarfesh Mem Gimel, and I learned it when I was in Yeshiva. I reread it. I mean, it's amazing. It's about how Hashem is great and, and, and how everything that, that exists is not even a ray of the sun in the sun. I mean, it's beautiful concepts. It's holy concepts. And when you think, even if you don't think deeply about it, you're just a little bit higher than, than your navel, a little bit higher than your table, even a little bit higher than kosher food. You're not thinking about kosher food because it's not about the laws of kosher. It's about what's happening metaphysically inside of you and what's happening through being connected to Hashem. And that's why when we talk about the study of, of, of Hasidus, in the early stages of Hasidus, it was to resuscitate the Jew. And now, where Hasidus is almost 280 or 300 years nearly old, now Hasidus is not about resuscitation. Hasidus is about appreciating God, which is really the preparation for Mashiach's coming. What will happen when Mashiach comes? Essentially, we will appreciate God. We believe in him now, and everyone understands a tiny bit of something of God. And when Mashiach will come, that will become our primary occupation. 
In other words, most of our mind, most of our passion will be focused on God. That's what will take place when Mashiach comes. Automatically, food will be secondary or less. Nice clothing will be secondary. Not because we're going to say, oh, it's, uh, it puts me down. It's, it just doesn't interest me anymore. Your mind and heart is elevated. When we study Hasidus today, it does that. And one of the ways to prepare, and to use the word to make Mashiach real to you, part of that has to do with the study of Hasidus. It, it's not enough just to say, I believe in the coming of Mashiach, I want Mashiach to come, I know he's about to come, and so on. Even to use the words, open up your eyes, you'll see Mashiach is here. You have to study things about God that allow a little depth to, to this perspective. Anyway, Gnu Geret, uh, which means I spoke too much. L'chaim, everybody, we're going to bench. Uh, we're chasidim, we're lucky, we're ashrenim atayv chalkeinu. May Hashem help that way before Hanukkah, the Mashiach comes, and we'll be able to be united with the Rebbe's. L'chaim. Amen. 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 Amen.